Okay, so let's go over a few concept tests and these are all concept tests from your practice tests. So for the first one on the practice test was this one, it says a positive charge Q is at point A and another one at point B here. The electric field at point P which is on the perpendicular bisector should be in which direction and these are the choices given. Okay, 8 seconds, 8 seconds folks, 5 seconds, 2 seconds, alright, so the, what would be the correct answer here? Yeah, it should be C because you can see the electric field due to this charge is going to be pointing radially away from it since it's positive, the electric field due to this charge will be radially away from it this way and since both of these charges are equal in magnitude and they are equidistant from this point. The electric field which, we, which is in this direction due to this one and the electric field that is in this direction due to this one will both be equal in magnitude and if you find their component horizontally and vertically what you will see is that the vertical components cancel out and the horizontal components add up, right? So that the net electric field is horizontal. So very good, it looks like most of you got it right which is good. Let us look at the next question. It says a solid insulating sphere, notice it says insulating sphere, it is very important to note whether it is an insulator or a conductor, right? Of radius r contains uniform volume distribution of positive charge, which of the graph below correctly gives the magnitude of electric field as a function of distance? And the choices are given to you, this is 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. So you have to choose A, B, C, D, E. Please talk to a person next to you, you have 1 minute starting now. The correct answer here is C, right? Is everybody agreeing that the correct answer here is C? And why is C the correct answer? Because if you remember what we learned is that if you have a volume distribution of, a ch of charge in an insulator, so you say had a yarn that had uniform charge everywhere in its volume and if you were to find the electric field say at some distance r away from the center over here, you could use Gauss's law and find how much is the Q enclosed in here and what we found is that the electric field always turns out to be E is equal to K Q enclosed over R square for the sphere for the spherical distribution of charges, right? But Q enclosed in this case went as R cubed and because of that what we found is that the electric field became some constant times you know r cube divided by r square which made it proportional to r if r is less than the radius of this thing. So this is let us say the radius of this yarn ball, if r was less than r then electric field went as constant times r and the reason it was proportional to r, so that means electric field is proportional to r and the reason this happened is because q enclosed went as r cubed, right? and there was an r square in the denominator, so r cubed divided by r square makes it proportional to r. And then there was some junk here, this constant depends upon total charge q, radius r, etc. Those are not changing, they are not variables, right? Okay, also the electric field outside, so this is for r less than r, 
for r greater than r electric field was k q divided by r square. So this is for r greater than equal to r, right? And this is for r less than or equal to r. So obviously if you try to book, put both of these together, you can see this is the magnitude of electric field and the direction is always radi radial, right? In this case, it's always radially outward since the charge is positive. So if you plot the magnitude of electric field as a distance, as a function of distance, if this is r is equal to r, we see that the electric field is proportional to r, so it's a linear increase and then it's a quadratic decrease. This is basically E proportional to 1 over R square and here it's E proportional to R, right? Any questions about this please? How do you change if it was a conductor? Okay, first of all, that's a very good question. If it was a conductor, first of all, in equilibrium, can you ever have a volume distribution of charge? No. So the first thing is, suppose you, if you had a short put, right? Can a short put ever have a volume distribution of charge in equilibrium? N why not? Because the electric field inside the conductor should be zero in equilibrium and if there is charge enclosed, electric field cannot be zero everywhere. We saw this. And so in a short put or any conductor, if, even if it's a spherical conductor, all of the excess charge will be on the top. So you cannot have a solid conductor like a short put with a volume distribution of charge. And if all of the charge is on the surface, what would be the electric field inside? Zero, right? I mean, because charge is uniformly distributed on the surface, right? In fact, that is the criteria for all the charge, you know, for electric field inside of a conductor. The charges must distribute themselves on the surface in such a way that the electric field inside is zero in equilibrium, right? So in that case, outside it will still be 1 over r square. So r, outside it will still look like this, 1 over r square, but inside the electric field will be 0. So if you had a solid metal ball, say for example, as I said, like a short put, so this is an example what you would have is that all of the excess charges must uniform themselves on the sphere on the outer surface such that the electric field stays zero everywhere inside and so if I try to plot electric field as a function of R, you know let's say that the radius of this thing is again capital R, there is electric field here. And here electric field magnitude at a distance r away is again going to have a magnitude k q divided by r square, but inside it's 0. So there is a discontinuity here. Let's say that this point was r is equal to r. In that case, the electric field will stay 0, 0, 0, and suddenly it jumps and it becomes 1 over r square. This, this thing is again e proportional to 1 over r square. So outside for r greater than r, it will be 1 over r square, inside it's 0. Is this making sense folks? So in fact, here you have to worry about the limit. If you go from inside infinitesimally close, it stays 0. If you go from outside infinitesimally close, it stays kq over r square, right? And suddenly there is a discontinuity at the point r is equal to r. That kind of a discontinuity is not there in this case. So whether you go from inside or outside at the point where little r becomes equal to the radius of this thing, you will see that the electric fields become the same from inside and outside, right? The slope is discontinuous here. Any questions about this folks? Anybody? Okay, let's look at the third question from your practice test. It says two point charges q1 and q2 are placed at distance r apart the electric field is zero at a point P between the charges, not necessarily at midpoint on the line segments connecting them. What can we conclude? A, Q1 and Q2 must have the same magnitude and sign. P must be midway between Q1 and Q2. C, Q1 and Q2 must have the same sign but may have different magnitudes. D, Q1 
Q1 and Q2 must have equal magnitudes and opposite signs. E, Q1 and Q2 must have opposite signs but may have different magnitudes. Please talk to a person next to you. You have one minute starting now. here is again C. C is the correct answer. Q1 and Q2 must have the same sign but may have different magnitudes. It looks like you guys, most of you got it right. And again, you can think about the reason. Suppose I have two positive charges, right? This is plus Q1 and let us say another one over here plus Q2 and we are told that the electric field is 0 somewhere, let us say over here, right? If the electric field, net electric field is 0 here, if we think about what is giving rise to electric field there, it is due to this charge and due to this charge, right? And if we think about which way is the electric field due to Q1, since it is a positive charge, its electric field will be away from it, let us call it E1. And here, due to this positive charge, its electric field will be away from that, since it is a positive charge also. And so, electric field is pointing that way. And you can see, since these two electric fields are pointing in opposite directions, they can cancel out at some point right at one point between the two charges and you may have to find exactly where it is if suppose I gave you a problem where I said oh find the distance that you may then you may have to solve for x. Suppose I gave you this whole distance was say 6 meters then you know if this distance is x this this might be 6 minus x meters right. So the thing is you may actually solve for where the, you know what would be the exact point where the electric field will be 0. But, but the important thing is the electric fields are definitely pointing in the opposite directions, right? What, ha what would have happened if I took plus Q1 and minus Q2, suppose this was a negative charge. If I look at some point between them, which way is the electric field due to plus? Right, it is away from it, let us call it E1. Which way is the electric field due to minus Q2? It is again towards Q minus Q2, so that would be that way too. These two electric fields cannot cancel each other out right? In this case, you might be able to find a point. Will you, is it possible for you to fi find a point on this side maybe? Yeah, because Q2 might have its electric field pointing this way. Q1 will have its electric field pointing away from it. So, maybe on this side you might be able to find an electric field if Q2 was smaller in magnitude than Q1, right? On the other hand, if Q1 was smaller in magnitude than Q2, then you might be able to find a point over here, but not between the two charges. And here it's talking about between the two charges. So the, here the electric field cannot be zero. Is that clear to everybody? Any questions about this, folks? Is that making sense? Okay. So here it was given to you that the electric field is zero between the two charges, and that can only be true if the charges have the same sign. Let's look at the next question. It says identical point charges are located at two vertices, vertices of an equilateral triangle. A third charge is placed so that the electric field at the third vertex is 0. The third charge must be placed on the perpendicular bisector of the line joining the first two charges, must be placed on the line joining the first two charges, must be identical to the first two charges, have the same magnitude as the first two charges but may have a different sign, must be placed at the center of the triangle. You have one minute. Please talk to a person next to you. Okay. 
All right, five seconds, folks. <coughs> okay, the correct answer here is A. Okay, and let's see why A is the correct answer. So we'll go over it in a second. Let's think about why A is the correct answer. So we have an equilateral triangle. Okay, let's choose any two vertices and put identical charges there. Let's say that you know we have this vertex with some charge plus q and let's say we have this vertex with some the same exact charge plus q because it's given to us they are exactly the same charges. What are we told? We have been given one more thing. What is it? The electric field is 0 at the third vertex, right? So the electric field here, the net electric field is 0 at the third vertex and we are asked what does it mean? And let's try to see first of all what is the electric field produced by the two charges that we know are there at this point? This charge will produce its electric field that will be pointing this way, right? Let's call it E1. This charge will produce its electric field at this point that will be pointing away from it like this. Let's give it a name E2. Now, since these two charges are identical, we know that the magnitude of E1 and E2 must be the same, right? And because of that, and, and, and also the distances are equal to this distance r if you want to call this r is exactly the same as this distance r here and because of that e1 and e2 have exactly the same magnitude and if e1 and e2 have the same magnitude if you look at say for example their components let's call this x direction and this y direction if you look at their components there will be a component of e1 along this direction, another one along this direction. There will be a component of e2 along this direction, another one along this direction. Does everybody appreciate that these horizontal components cancel out? So the net electric field due to just these two charges is pointing which way? Up. Do you see that? So now you must have another charge that is canceling this effect if the net electric field is zero. Is everybody appreciating that these two charges are producing, you know, electric field that is pointing up? What can cancel that electric field? Think about placing a charge on the perpendicular bisector of these two charges. If you place some charge that has a, you know, appropriate magnitude somewhere along this line, you might be able to cancel this electric field that is pointing up. Why do I say that? For example, think of putting a negative charge somewhere here, you know, minus something, Q3. Oh, this minus Q3, which way will be, will, be, will be the electric field due to that at this point? It will be pointing towards the negative charge, right? So in this case, there will be an electric field E3 that is pointing down and E3 might be able to cancel the net effect of Q1 and Q2 which is pointing up, right? Of course, exactly how big Q3 should be depends upon where you place it. Similarly, if you want to place this charge up above this point on the perpendicular bisector, then it should be positive. Is that making sense, folks? But the point is, it should be placed on the perpendicular bisector. If you wanted to cancel the effect of some electric field that is pointing straight up. Is that logic clear to everybody? Okay. Let's look at the next question then. The diagram shows the electric field lines in a region of space containing two small charged spheres Y and Z. Then which of these is true? Y is negative and Z is positive. The magnitude of the electric field is the same everywhere. The electric field is 0 at point X. A small negatively charged body placed at X would be pushed to the right. Y and Z must have the same sign. Please talk to the person next to you and your time starts now. What do you think should be
it be the correct answer here? D, a small negatively charged, okay. So the thing is, one thing we can see is that since the electric field lines were going towards uh, one of those charges, that, must, that charge must be negative, right? And it was going away from one of those charges, that charge must be positive. Because electric field lines always go out of the positive charges and they go towards negative, right? They always end at negative charges and they always start at positive charges, okay? All right, so the correct, why is this the correct answer? Because you can see if the electric field lines are going towards Z, Z must be negatively charged. And if Z is negatively charged, if you put some positive thing here, it's true that it will feel a force towards the negative thing, right? <coughs> positive thing will feel a force towards negative thing. So it makes sense that the correct answer here is D. Okay, let's look at the next question here. It says, a hollow metal sphere is electrically neutral, that means it has no excess charge. A small amount of negative charge is suddenly pl placed at point P on this metal sphere. If we check this excess negative charge a few seconds later, we will find one of the following possibilities. All of the excess charge stays at point, around point P. Excess charge has distributed itself evenly on the outside surface. Excess charge is evenly distributed over the inside and outside surfaces. Most of the charge is still at point P, but some charge will spread over the sphere. There will be no excess charge left on the sphere at all. Okay, please talk to a person next to you. All right, seven seconds. Okay, so since this is a metal sphere, the answer should be B, right, that the charge has distributed itself on the outer sphere because that's the way you know already from Gauss's law that if the charges are distributed evenly on the outer surface of a sphere, the electric field everywhere inside the sphere is zero. So that's the correct answer, right? If it was an insulator, then how would the answer change? Yeah, then it will just stay where you put it, right? Because charges don't move around in an insulator. That's right, exactly. Very good. Okay, let's look at the next question. It says, an electron traveling north enters a region where the electric field is uniform and points north. The electron speeds up, slows down, veers east, veers west, continues with the same speed in the same direction. Talk to a person next to you. You have one minute to answer this question. <laughs> So the thing is, in this particular question, what we are told, let's say that this is my north direction and this is my south direction, then we are told that the electron's velocity is upward because electron is moving north, right? 
and the electric field is uniform. This is showing the direction of electric field and it is uniform and it is pointing up. Now, which way will be the force on this electron? Because remember, F is equal to Q times E. So, the force and the electric field point in the same direction if the charge is positive and force and electric field point in the opposite direction if Q is negative, right. In this case, since it is electron, that means it has a negative charge and that means which way is the force? South. Do you see that the force on this electron, you know, is acting downward? And if the force is acting downward, that means the acceleration is downward also. Force and acceleration are always in the same direction, always, because F is equal to what? Ma, that is Newton's second law. So, if the force is in this direction, that means acceleration is in that direction. That means we know whenever velocity and acceleration point in opposite directions, the object slows down, does not it? It decelerates, it slows down. So, in this case, the electron will slow down. Does that make sense, folks? That the electron will slow down? Okay, please. If it was in the same direction, would it speed up or would it stay at the same speed? So, if suppose it was what? Okay, that is a very good question. So, let us try to do different cases. So, you could, for example, say the electron is moving, you know, this is again electron moving upward. And what if the electric field was pointing down, for example? If the electric field was pointing down, this time again the force and electric field will be opposite because electron is negatively charged. So, this time the force on the electron will be upward and in this case the electron will speed up because force and velocity are in the same direction, right. Now, let us consider a case where let us say velocity and electric field were pointing at you know some angle other than 0 degrees or 180 degrees like this, right. So, if suppose you had say for example the electric field pointing like this. This is the direction of electric field and suppose you launch some electron into this field, which way do you want to launch it? Well, let us say that you know you launch it like this at some angle or oh, this is electron minus E and you launch it like this at with some velocity like this, okay. And in this case you are asked will at the moment where you launch it at this particular instant is the electron going to slow down or move faster because one thing you have to realize is that these charged particles in a uniform electric field are going to follow a parabolic path, right. We already said they will follow a parabolic path, it is just like <coughs> gravitational fields. The only thing is charges can be positive or negative whereas masses are always positive. But otherwise in a uniform field we know it is going to go in a parabola, but suppose you had asked me at this instant, at this instant what I see is that there are two components of velocity. This velocity if I want to look at it in terms of x and y components, do you see that this velocity has one component like this, you know we can call it vx, another component vy which is like this and vy at this instant is in the same direction as electric field. Do you see that? And since vy is in the same direction as electric field, what do you, is it more like that case? Do, do you know what I am talking about? What, I am trying to explain to you what would it be for a general case. So, in this particular case at this instant, the two components of this velocity, right? Vy is that way. Now, which way is the force on this electron? Who wants to tell me which way is the force on the electron? Down. Down, very good because the electric field is pointing up. F is equal to QE, the force on the electron is definitely down. You can see that the Y component of velocity and the force are opposite to each other, right? And that means what will happen? <coughs> hmm? So, so no, no, wait a second. So, Y component of velocity is pointing opposite to the direction of force. So, the, the one thing that you will see is that y component will decrease, right? So, v y decreases. Okay, what about the x component? Is the x component of velocity changing due to the force? It is not changing in y because it is perpendicular to the force. What you will see is that slowly this particle will actually slow down, slow down, slow down, go to some highest point and then it will start going down. 
do, do you see what I am talking about? I am saying that this particle might go something like this and then it will actually start going down. Why is, the, first of all you knew that it will go in a parabola, but the point is that one of the components of the velocity in this case is slowing the particle down at the highest point. What will happen here at the highest point? <coughs> Vy has become 0, our article has slowed down, slowed down, slowed down, Vy has become 0 and what has Vf, Vx done? Nothing. Huh? Nothing. Vx stays the same here, right? When the particle comes down, Vx again stays the same. Do you, do you see? Do you see why Vx stays the same? This is like launching a particle at some angle. Suppose you have you you launch a particle in gravitational field. So g is the gravitational field, and if you launch a particle with some velocity v, the particle slows down and then it starts coming back down. Suppose if you were at a cliff and you threw the thing, it will go up and it will come down. At the highest point, again if this is Vx and this is Vy, at the highest point here Vy becomes equal to 0, Vx stays what it is. Why is this object slowing down? Again because its velocity, Y component of velocity is opposite to the gravitational acceleration. Same is the situation here. Right? Is everybody seeing it? Any questions about this? Okay, what would have happened if you had launched this particle not like this, but if you had launched it? So, if suppose you had electric field this way and you had launched the particle, let us say this is electron, like this at with some velocity this way initially, what will happen to this? Huh? Yeah, the thing is, you know, because you can see that basically this thing will just go like a parabola again, right? If it was a positive charge, negative charge will go like this, like a parabola. Positive charge, if suppose this was a positively charged particle, this is the electric field. Suppose this was a positively charged particle launch with some velocity v, this is going to go like this, right? In the direction of electric field, is everybody seeing why negative and positive charges will bend in different directions and go as, as par, uh, par, parabolas in both cases? But notice, what I want you to notice in both these cases is just like in the gravitational case, the object does not just plop down. You know, if there is a horizontal component of velocity, the object goes as a parabola. What if the situation was like this? What if the, I launch the particle at rest? So there was no initial velocity, the electron was just left from rest. V was equal to 0 initially and then I let go. What would happen in this case? What would be the trajectory? Yeah, in this case it will be straight down, right? You see that it will actually gain velocity this way and it will go straight down. Similarly, if I had launched a positive charge from rest, this is the electric field and if I had launched a positive charge from rest, this charge will just go straight up. It is like saying, well, if I just let go of this thing straight like this, then yes, it is going to go straight down. But there, if there is an x component which is perpendicular to the direction in which the force is, that x component will not change x component of velocity will stay and in that case the particle will start bending in a parabolic path if the acceleration is constant. Does that make sense? Any questions about this? Does everybody understand the differences between this situation, that situation, this situation, this situation, all of these situations? Is everybody appreciating the differences? Okay, let us move on. Here is the last question from your practice test. It says the electric field at point P, a distance z from a charged disk of radius r along its central axis is given by that, where sigma is the charge per unit area. At points far away from the disk, z going to infinity, the electric field produced by the disk is, by the way, when you are talking about far away, 
you are still talking about a case where you can feel the effect of the disc. Okay? So, if you use your intuition here, you will be able to get the right answer. So, please talk to a person next to you, you have one minute. All right, <clears throat> in this particular case, the easiest way to get the answer and figure out that it will be the same as if it were a point charge is just to think conceptually. If you were at Cathedral of Learning and I have a disk of charge here, wouldn't it look like a point? You know, for such a far away point, you know, which is almost infinitely away as far as this disk of charge is concerned, it will almost look like a point charge. So, the electric field will just be kq over r square. So, it will just be the electric field produced by a point charge. If you want me to rigorously prove it for you, I can, did I actually do that in the, in, when we were doing this? Yeah, actually, I think if you remember what we did in the class when we were doing this stuff, we actually showed that that would be the case. Do you remember that? We proved R. Huh? We proved R on Z. Yeah, but that's the variable. I mean, the thing is, the variable here is Z. You know, the, the, the thing that is changing is called Z here. So it doesn't matter. In some cases, it might be called X or Y or Z or even Harriet. The point is, whatever is the var uh, variable, if that variable is getting really large, so that means you're getting farther and farther away from the charge, at some point it just looks like a blob, right? At, at some point you just think of it as one little thing because compared to the distance where you're trying to find the electric field, the size of this thing is not very important. Is, any, is there any question about this? Please. Like Z is going to infinity mm -hmm. on an exam or something, do you mean like you're still going to be able to feel it or is it past that? Like no, it's always, otherwise you're not going to be asked this question. So Z going to infinity in the calculus language always means, let me again redo what we had done in the class because I even showed you doing an expansion in the class what Z going to infinity in calculus terms means. But let's try to do it again. So it just means that choose the case where Z is extremely large and let's see and this was, this should already be there in your notes. So suppose I start with E is equal to sigma divided by 2 epsilon 0. Because any time in calculus you say z going to infinity or x going to infinity or x going to 0, it does not mean that you should just plug that thing equal to 0 in the beginning formula and get a 0 answer. It means look at the limit. That is what it always means. So let us try to look at the limit of this thing. And what we have is this z divided by, in the denominator, do you see we have z square plus r square? One way to do z square plus r square will be to pull z out. You know, why would I want to, I do not want to give a lecture in mathematics, but the thing is, why do you want to pull z out here? Because if I want to pull z out, do you see that z square plus r square will become 1 plus r square over z square? to the power half, I am just writing square root can be written as half. Why is it that I pulled out z here? Can anybody say because you, you guys have all learned calculus, you know. So the thing is, so in other words, one thing I can see is that this z, this z cancels out. I am left with just that thing. Is that a good thing to have in the denominator 1 plus r square over z square? Why? Well, because yeah, if z, go ahead please. No, actually it is to the power half. So you are taking the square root? Huh? Okay, sorry. 
sorry, I'm taking the square root. So what I'm saying is that if you, you know, it was really, yes, you're right. So it was z squared to the power half, which is z. What he's saying is that if you pull out z squared from here, shouldn't there be a z squared? The point is, yes, that's true. It's z squared square root and z squared square root is z. Sorry. So that's a good point. So that was z and then z and z got cancelled. Now the good thing about having something like this, notice what I have there. I have this thing here is something like this, 1 over 1 plus r square over z square to the power half. Do you see I have that? And that thing is the same is 1 plus r square over z square to the power minus a half. If you take it in the numerator, that's what it is. <coughs> and then you can do something that is called Taylor expansion. Have you guys heard of Taylor expansion ever? And the good thing is that if I told you that z, go, z goes to infinity, which I have given to you, then this thing is roughly equal to, roughly equal to according to Taylor expansion. This is the way Taylor expansion works for any function. How many people have seen Taylor expansion before? Okay, good. It looks like at least half the class has. And how many have not seen Taylor expansion ever? Okay. I mean, <laughs> I'm sure that at some point or the other you will see it. But basically, the idea is that if you have some function, it is roughly equal to this exponent, you can bring it here. And this thing will roughly become equal to 1 minus half r square over z square. You know, why is it that I need to do this? Why, why is it that I don't just put infinity here? What would be the problem if I put infinity here? If I put here 1 over infinity, does this become 0? Yeah, that becomes 0. And then what happens here? I have 1 over 1, 1 minus 1. I get a 0. I'm throwing the baby with the bath. So what you must have been taught in calculus is that always you should be doing an expansion to make sure that you don't throw everything away and say my answer is 0. You should try to get what is the leading order term. Do, do you see what I'm saying? So you need to keep in your expansion whatever is the biggest term that is not 0. Right? Because we know that when I say z is very large compared to r, you know, I just want to say, I, I'm really talking about it in terms of calculus. I'm saying z is extremely large compared to r. That's what z, limit z going to infinity means. All right? So if that's the case, then do you see that this is what it becomes here? So basically then, what, what does my electric, if this is the case, then the electric field becomes E is equal to sigma divided by 2 epsilon 0. And what do I have here? I have 1 minus, look, I had 1 over this square, which was this, which turned out to be this. So let's try to plug this thing here. And if I plug this here, I have 1 minus half r square over z square. Right? Is everybody seeing? In this, again, this is already assuming, this is roughly equal to, this is already assuming that z is going to infinity compared to r. So do you see 1 and 1 get cancelled? This is this one and this is the one that came from here. So 1 and 1 get cancelled. This minus and minus make it a plus and I get E is equal to sigma divided by 2 epsilon 0 r square over half z square. Right? Now what is sigma? Anybody remembers what is sigma? Sigma is the charge on the disk, right? It's a, it's a charge density on the disk. Charge density should be charge per unit area. So let's say that the total, cha total charge on a disk, total charge on this disk, let's say is Q, right? Let's say radius of this disk is R. What would be the area of this disk? Good. So what would be the sigma? Q over pi r square. Does everybody see that sigma can be written as Q over pi r square? So then, if sigma can be written as Q over pi r square, then electric field becomes Q divided by pi r square. And then I have all the rest of the stuff, which is 
R square divided by, let's multiply this 2 by this 2 and there's epsilon 0, that's 4 epsilon 0, z square, R square and R square get cancelled. Hey, what are we getting? We are finding that electric field is 4 pi epsilon 0, z square. Isn't 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 what we used to call k? So electric field magnitude does turn out to be kq over z square. So the point is that the electric field far away at some distance z from this disk will behave as a, will look like as though this disk was just a blob of point charge and it makes sense. So I'm not expecting you to actually really work through this and show me, but this is what we had done in the class. If you look at your work in the class that we had done, we did do this and we looked at this limit and we saw that electric field does turn to the electric field due to a point charge. Any questions about this folks, anybody? All right, then let's move on and now we are going to start talking about electrical potential again and <clears throat> electrical potential and electrical potential energy. So before we get started, I want all of you to talk to each other and remind me what was the relationship between electrical potential energy and work done. What was the relationship between electrical potential energy and work done because this will turn out to be something that is very important for us. <coughs> Tell me what is the relationship between electrical potential and work done. Remember this is also something you learned in mechanics last, last year. Just that you used to talk in the context of gravitational potential energy and now we are talking about electrical potential energy but the relationship between the work done and potential energy is very similar. Go ahead please. Very good. Work done by some field is equal to negative of the change in potential energy. Remember? So today what we are going to do is we are going to think about what would be the work done if we change the, if, if the displacement is really small. Can we say this? The dW is some infinitesimal work done. by the electric field in this case, in physics 1 it would have been gravitational field and that I can write as first of all work done can always be written which way, can I write it as f dot ts, that is another thing you know work can always be written as f dot ds integral over from the initial to the final displacement right. Isn't that the basic definition of work that you learned in physics 1? So remember, in fact, in the exam, any, any time you have an exam question that relates to work done, you need to think about two different things. You need to think which of these two things is useful here because I have seen students who have really gone doing the problem in a very roundabout way because they use the equation that was too complicated. So we know this, that work done can be written as integral f dot ds from the initial to the final point, right? Or we can write what you said there, which is work can be written as negative of the change in potential energy. You see what I'm saying? This thing delta u really means this. So in other words, work done can be, 
sorry, this is there is a negative sign, negative of u final minus u initial. Or if you like, remember this, that the potential was related to potential energy like this, potential was defined as potential energy per unit charge. Do you remember this? And if that's the case, can I write, from here you can see u, the potential energy can be written as q times v. And if that's the case, can I write work done as minus q times v final minus v initial? So what I'm trying to say to you is that if in some problem I told you a point charge of 10 power minus 6 coulomb moves from this point to this point, the potential here is this, you know the potential energy here is this, the potential energy here is this, should you be using this or should you be just using this? Do you see how easy it is if you just say, oh work done is negative of the change in potential energy. So this would be the work done by the electrostatic force, right, by the electric field. On the other hand, if you went through this thing, it would be much more difficult calculation. So the point is that you should look at which of these is more useful. But now at this point, I'm going to show you the relation between electrical potential and electric field by using both of these things. So I'm going to make use of the fact that work done is integral from the initial point to the final point of force dotted with displacement. And I'm also going to make use of this. So both of these will be made use of in coming up with a relation between potential and field. Why am I trying to get a relation between potential and field? Because remember I told you that potential and field must be related to each other because potential and potential energy should give you the same information that we get from field and forces. It's just a different way of thinking about it. The good thing about potential and potential energy is that these are scalar quantities. In some situations, they may be easier for you to calculate, right? Or in some problems, you might be able to do the calculation much simply, much more simply by making use of potential. Remember, we talked about what is the speed of some charge at a certain point, given the speed was initially zero here and you knew the potential here and potential here. You know, you could use conservation of mechanical energy then. So potential formulation and potential energy formulation can make some problems very easy compared to force formulation and field formulation, all right, which are vectors. So anyway, so, so the point is we need to obviously understand how is potential related to field, something that we already learned in chapters 21, 22, and 23, that was field. Now we are learning about potential, so obviously the two are related, we already discussed it, what is the relation? And the relation will come up, come from this relation here. So I'm saying dW, which is an infinitesimal work done, one way to write this will be if, if the force is not changing over a small distance, let's say, then we can write it as F dot dS. Right, would you agree with that? Just from the definition, <coughs> infinitesimal work done is this. Okay, so if this is what it is, I also can write the infinitesimal work done in terms of this, right? So what would be the total work done? Total work then will be integral f dot ds from i to f. But can I write w as equal to this minus q v final minus v initial? Is that okay? Yeah, because both of these things give me the same information. So instead of w, I can write minus q v final minus v initial is equal to integral from the initial point to the final point. And can I write f in terms of q and e using this relation? Using the relation f is equal to qe, I can write f as q, which is a constant, e dot ds. The good thing is I can cancel the q out and what did I end up with? Notice what I ended up with, a very important relationship. I found that v final minus v initial 
that means change in potential is negative this sign this negative sign I am going to take to the other side integral from initial point to final point of E dot ds. This is the important relationship between electric field and potential. You can see that negative of the integral of the electric field dotted with ds from some initial point to final point is the change in potential. Any questions about this? Okay, let us try to make use of this relation now to find the potential due to a point charge. Do you know how much is the electric field produced by a point charge at a distance r away? What is it? Anybody? All of you should be able to say this now, you know, for three chapters we have been repeating. Go ahead, please. Excellent. Okay, the electric field produced by a point charge at a distance r away is obviously radial, it is radially outward for positive charge, radially inward for negative charge and its magnitude is kq over r square, right. So the thing is I want to now find what is the potential, what is the potential due to this point charge at distance r away. You see I am not asking you about field anymore, I am saying well yeah this charge is producing some field and you told me what it is, you, he already told us what is the potential that is produced by this point charge at a distance r away. We will make use of this relation to figure that out. I can plug the field here, do the integral and I will find the potential. Notice that we will find the difference in potential and that is fine because potential is always undefined by a constant value and what we are going to say is that we are going to choose our reference point to be such that the potential infinitely away from a point charge is 0. That is going to be a reference. So let us try to figure out potential due to a point charge. Okay, so here is the situation. Let us say that I have some point charge initially at some point here which is at a distance r away from some point and then I take this point charge to infinity. So let us say this was the initial situation. This is some point P. So initially some point charge Q is at a distance r away from some point P and then final situation is this. This plus Q has gone to infinity. So infinitely away from point Q. So the point, point P, so now I have taken this point charge, moved it to a very far away point from this point P and we can again talk about how much is the work done by the electric field and stuff, right? And we can go through this formulation again. Now here is the thing so, and so we can talk about how much is the change in potential energy, how much is the change in potential and in order to do that we are going to make use of the fact that we already know that electric field due to a point charge is kq over r square. Now, so we will make use of this relation v final minus v initial is equal to negative of integral from the initial point to the final point of E dot ds. So here is the thing. First of all, what would be ds here? Which way are we moving the charge? 
Look, you could do the movement in many different ways. Initially, the charge was here, right? And then I am moving it to infinitely far away point. I could do the movement this way. I could do the movement this way. I could do it this way. In all of those different ways, I can move this charge infinitely away. But do you think that the work done, you know, which is related to all these things, we can see this here, will depend upon the path that you take? No, because again we are talking about a conservative force and remember just like in gravitational case, gravitational force is a conservative force and the work done does not depend upon the path, it only depends upon the initial point and final point. Electrostatic force is also a conservative force, that's why you can associate this concept of potential energy and so work done doesn't depend upon path, it only cares about what is the initial point, what is the final point, right? Remember in the gravitational case, you only cared about the initial height and the final height and if suppose the object went up and down and came back to the same height, the work done was zero, work done by gravity was zero, right? Same is true here, work done by electrostatic force only cares about the initial and final points, not on the, it doesn't depend upon the path and so we can choose the path that is easiest for us, why make our life complicated? What would be the easiest path to, to choose here? Straight line, yeah, so you should, the easiest path to choose is the straight line path, right? So if we choose, so that means our displacement, we are considering displacement ds, an infinitesimal displacement which is pointing this way, right? And so the electric field and displacement here, what is the electric field that is produced by this charge, say at this point? Electric field is pr produced is like this, right? And so basically what we are trying to say then is that we have Vf minus Vi is equal to minus the initial point is at a distance r away. So initially the charge is at a distance r away from that point P and in the end it is infinitely far away. Is everybody seeing? So initially that charge is at a distance r away from point P and finally the charge is infinitely far away from point P and electric field is KQ over r square and my ds is just going to be dr. I might as well choose a simple path. Also what did we choose our, as a reference? What would be the potential infinitely far away? Hmm? Zero. Yeah, so we are saying that V final is zero because we choose our reference potential to be zero infinitely far away from the charge, point charge. Okay, so then what we get here is something that we can do pretty easily. So basically V final is zero, we are saying this is zero. So what we have is minus Vi is equal to this integral minus Kq times integral 1 over R square dr from initial point R to infinity. Anybody remembers what is this integral of 1 over x square dx? You know, this is the same thing as integral of x to the power minus 2 dx, right? What was that? Do you remember this one? Integral of x to the power n dx was equal to? What was it? x to the power n plus 1 over n plus 1. Do you remember that? Huh? Sorry? Right, so what will we, what will have we have to do here? This will be x to the power minus 2 and do you see n is minus 2? Add 1 to it, so let's add 1 to it, divide this by n, n is minus 2 plus 1. 
right? Is this making sense folks? And so this is equal to x to the power minus 1 divided by minus 1 and this is just nothing but minus 1 over x. x to the power minus 1 is nothing but 1 over x. So basically what is this integral then? Whether you call it x or r it's the same thing, right? Right, so what we have is minus v is equal to kq and this integral just becomes negative of 1 over r. And now we have to evaluate it at infinity and at r. Right? By the way, let's cancel one of the signs here. This and this get cancelled. So what we are left with then is that vi is equal to k q. Let's plug in the values. So initially you put the, which limit will you put? One, minus 1 over infinity and then you will put minus, minus, minus will make it a plus 1 over r. 1 over infinity is 0. So that goes to 0, this, this goes to 0. And so what you get is v is equal to kq over r. And this is the answer. What we are learning, we don't even have to call it vi, we can just call it v now. So what we are learning is that the potential, the potential that is produced by a point charge at a distance r away. So v at this point, v at this point is kq over r potential produced at this point by this charge at a distance r away is kq over r, sorry, this q is q. Folks, I changed the name of my q, let's give it a consistent name, I'm calling it capital Q because this capital Q is that charge. Is everybody with me? Any questions about this? Okay, so now that you know potential due to one point charge is kq over r, what do you think will happen if we have two point charges and I ask you what is the potential here? Can you use superposition principle and tell me what would be the total potential? The only thing that you have to remember is that this problem is a lot easier than you think. Why is that? So suppose I give you this question here. And I want all of you to work on it. So suppose you have some charge Q1 which is 10 power minus 6 coulomb and here's another charge Q2 which is 2 times 10 power minus 6 coulomb and suppose I ask you what is the potential here which is at a distance of let's say 1 meter from this charge and it is at a distance of 4 meters from this charge. Everybody should be talking to a person next to you. The question is what is the total potential at this point produced by this charge and this charge? Is the question clear please? Can you just add them because it's a scalar? Excellent. That is the point that I was trying to make. That what you have to remember is that this problem is a lot easier than you think. This is not about a vector. It's, it's not that we are trying to find field or forces. So there is no direction to anything. All you have to do is you are adding some numbers. This is just a number, right? So what would be the total potential then? Anybody wants to tell me? What would be the potential at this point? Let's call this point P. Vp will be equal to, let's call it V1 plus V2, the potential due to this plus potential due to that. And what will Vp be? Right, it will be kq1 over r1 plus kq2 over r2, right? And this is just equal to, so vp can just be written as, remember what k was? k was 9 times 10 power 9 in the SI system of units. Let's pull k out. q1 is 10 power minus 6 coulombs divided by r1. Isn't this r1? 4 meters and this thing 1 meter we can call r2 because that's the distance of this point from point charge q. 
So R1 will just be 4 meters plus Q2 is 2 times 10 power minus 6 Coulomb divided by R2 which is 1 meter. So your answer and since we, I wrote everything in SI unit, charges were in Coulomb, distances were in meter, this was K was in SI unit, what should be the answer, the unit of answer for potential? Huh? Yeah, you can call it joules per coulomb, which is the same as what we called volt. Yeah, volt, volt is a shorter name. So, so remember, we had defined potential as potential energy per unit charge, right? So the unit of potential should be joules per coulomb. And we said joules per coulomb can be given a shorter name, volts or V, right? So that's the, the unit, volts. Right? Or you can write joules per coulomb, that's fine. It's the same thing. Any questions about this? Okay, what about, can we plot this thing? What will the plot of a potential look like for a point charge? If I were to plot the potential due to a point charge, what would it look like? Let's try. So here is the point charge plus Q and what we are saying is that the potential at a distance R away, this is some point P and we are saying V at this point is K Q over R, right? So what will K Q over R look like? Tell me, what happens right at the location of the charge? You know, right at the location of the charge, R goes to 0, right? Do you see that? And if R goes to 0, what will happen to the potential? Uh, no, it will blow up actually, right? It will diverge, it will become infinite, won't it? 1 over 0 is infinity. One, 1 over something really small will blow up, will diverge. So the thing is, you can see that if this, as, as I keep going closer and closer and closer and closer, the potential keeps increasing. You see what I'm saying? So if my point P was here, do you see potential will be more here than here? And if I go infinitely far away, if R was infinity, the potential is 1 over infinity is 0. But 1 over 0 is extremely large. So the potential at the location of the charge is infinite. And then it, go, it falls off as 1 over R. And then infinitely far away, it will go to 0. Right, so V is equal to K Q over R. Right? By the way, potential is a scalar quantity, but potential can be negative or positive. When will the potential be negative? For example, what kind of charge will produce negative potential? A negative charge, right? So compared to the case, reference case, where the potential infinitely away from a charge is zero, that's what we assume, a reference point, a negative charge always produces negative potential. So potential due to a negative point charge. Can, anybody, can, can you guys try to draw the plot yourself? What would be the potential due to a negative point charge. So here is minus Q, right? And so at a, at a distance R away, the potential again will be V is equal to K Q over R, but this Q is negative. So this time, what will it be? Let's say that Q was equal to, let's say Q was equal to minus 10 power minus 6 coulomb. Then in this case, the potential turns out to be minus K times 10 power minus 6 divided by R, you know, this much in volts 
if I write k and r in SI unit. So suppose k and r are already written in SI unit. So this time if I plot potential as a function of r, do you see that if r goes to infinity, 1 over infinity is again 0. But if r goes to 0, 1 over 0 will be something really large, but this time it is negative large. So that means it goes to negative infinity here at r equal to 0 and then it again falls off as 1 over r square. So v is equal to minus you know say 10 to the minus 6 times k over r for this particular charge which is minus 10 to the minus 6 coulomb. So this thing again becomes infinitely large at the location of this negative charge. So one thing that you learn is that as you go farther and farther away from a positive charge the potential decreases. As you go farther and farther from a negative charge the potential increases compared to something that was really small and negative, right? Because minus infinity is really small, minus infinity is a very small number, it's very, very small thing. So the potential close to a negative charge will be extremely small, potential as you go farther and farther away, the potential increases and it becomes very infinitely far away from it, it will become 0, right? And remember this is all assuming potential at infinity is 0. Any questions about this? Okay, then the last topic that I want to touch upon before we move on, uh, let me give you a problem before we move on just to make sure that you know how to do these problems. So <clears throat> suppose I ask you this question, work with the person next to you. So suppose I say there is a charge plus q1 which is 10 power minus 6 coulomb, there is another charge minus q2 which is minus 10 power minus 6 coulomb, there is another charge which is minus q3 which is minus 3 times 10 power minus 6 coulomb and I am asking you what is the potential that is produced at a point which is at a distance r3 which is 3 meters which is at a distance r1, which is 4 meters, which is at a distance r2, which is 2 meters. So the question is V is equal to what at this point? I want everybody to be working with the person next to them. First of all, have I given you enough information to answer this question? Yeah, I have actually. So if I had asked you to find electric field at that point, would you have said that you need more information about the angles and things? Yeah, but for potential I have already given you enough information. You can find potential at that point based upon just what I gave you. So work with the person next to you. Anybody from the last row please, can you help me, what, how should I do that? Go ahead, anybody folks, please go ahead. So V should be equal to? Good, we should add up the contributions of the three things and there is no vectors to worry about, right? No, okay, so what will it be? How many terms here are negative and how many terms are positive? Two of them are? negative and one of them is positive, right, exactly. So basically I have k q1 over r1 plus k q2 over r2 plus k q3 over r3, right. And what is this equal to? I am going to leave it up to you. You can pull the k out 
and then q1 is just 10 power minus 6 coulomb divided by r1 which is 4 meters k we know is 9 times 10 power 9 in si unit q2 we know is a negative number so this will be minus 10 to the power minus 6 coulomb divided by r2 which is 2 meters the third one q3 is negative also so this is minus 3 times 10 power minus 6 coulomb divided by 3 meters and what is the unit here folks volts right so the unit of potential is volts so the answer is I am not going to work, work it out but you can see that two of the terms are negative and one of the terms is positive if you choose everything to be in SI unit the final answer is going to be in SI unit which is in volts right or joules per coulomb volts is joules per coulomb any questions about this ok so then let me discuss with you this concept of equipotential surfaces what do you think equipotential would mean yeah, that means somehow on this surface the potential must be the same everywhere, right? That's what equipotential must mean. Can anybody think of a surface that would be equipotential surface for a point charge? So think of a surface which has the same potential everywhere due to a point charge. Go ahead, please. A sphere with point charge at the center. How many people agree with him? That's absolutely correct. So, equipotential surface due to a point charge is a sphere with charge at the center. So, for example, if you look at this charge plus Q here, and if I draw a sphere which is concentric with this charge here say at with a radius of r is v the same everywhere kq over r the same everywhere if all these distances are r isn't the potential due to this point charge everywhere the same so then this sphere is an equipotential surface due to a point charge what if i drew another sphere which is concentric with this Is that another equipotential surface due to this point charge? Yes. So the potential there will be smaller. Let's call this distance R2. But the point is that all points on that sphere are at the same distance R2 away. And the potential anywhere on this sphere will be KQ over R2. So basically, what have we concluded then? We have concluded that the equipotential surfaces due to point charge, due to a point charge, are concentric spheres with this point charge at the center, right? The closer you get to the point charge, is this another equipotential surface? If it was concentric with this, yeah. Because every point on the surface has the same exact potential. Is this clear to anybody? Okay, now I want you to think about this. If suppose, I look at one equipotential surface. Let's say that we look at this equipotential surface and we look at a point here A, let's call this point A and there here is another point, point B. If I take a test charge, suppose I take a test charge plus Q, 0. So this is another test charge. This is not the point charge that is producing the potential here. This is a test charge that I'm bringing at this point A and then I move this point charge, test charge to point B. The question is, do you think there was any work done if I move this test charge from this point to this point? Please talk to a person next to you one minute. So the question is, what is work done in taking the test charge from A to B? Is everybody understanding the question? I move a test charge on the equipotential surface from one point to the other. What's the work done by the electric field? Any 
thoughts, folks? <coughs> Anybody? What do you think might be the work done in moving from one place to the other on an equipotential surface? Go ahead, please. Zero. Yeah, it turns out the work done is zero. And how do we know that? Because? Very good, exactly. So the reason the work done is zero, <coughs> the easiest way to see this is not to say work done is integral f dot ds, but the easiest way to see it is work done is negative of the change in potential energy, which can be written as, so what I'm saying is work done from A to B can be written as negative of U final minus U initial, or it can be written as minus Q0 times V final minus V initial, right? And if it's an equipotential surface, V final is V initial. So this is, we know this is zero because the potential is the same at the initial and final points. And if that's the case, then we know WAB equal to zero. So that means there was no work done in moving a test charge from one point to the other on any equipotential surface. You take a test charge from here to here, no work done. Or you take it anywhere on this equipotential surface from one point to the other, no work done, right? Now, the question is why is that the case? Because if I think about the other definition of work done, I can also think of it like this. I can say that this is integral of f dot ds from the initial to the final point. Isn't this the other definition of work done? This is one definition, this is another definition. Both are equally good. But when we know, when we use this, remember f is equal to qe, so I can write this as q times e dot ds. How can we be sure that this work done is really zero? Because that's what we are finding using this other equation. Both of them are equally good. What does it say to us? Is the electric field zero? No. There is definitely an electric field at this point produced by this point charge. In fact, we know the electric field is always pointing radially away from this point charge. Don't we know that? That the electric field is always pointing radially away. So we know that the electric field is not zero at point A produced by this charge, nor is the electric field zero produced by this point charge at point B, right? It's in fact pointing radially out. We also know that there is a displacement. We displace the charge Q you know, like this, like this, like this, like this, we displaced it. So the displacement is not zero, the electric field is not zero. How can the work then be zero? Go ahead, please. The electric field is the same at the initial and final positions. So okay, but if the electric field is the same at every point, all you can say is I'll pull it out. Right? So the thing is, so, so let, let's do it slowly. So. This can be written as magnitude of E, magnitude of ds times cosine theta, right? So the thing is, if the electric field is constant, you know, you, we, let's pull it out. So we can pull it out and we have this integral ds times cosine theta. We still haven't convinced ourselves that the electric field, that the work done is zero, yeah. Sign of that is zero. Right. The only time that we can really convince ourselves that the work done will definitely be zero if we say that this theta, which is the angle between the electric field and the displacement on this equipotential surface, is perpendicular to each other. That means theta is 90 degrees. If theta is 90 degrees, cosine theta will be zero. And in that case, we can say that no matter how small the displacement is, even if you're moving from point A to point B here, which are very close or you know, really, really close, you will say, well, the work done is zero because the two are at 90 degree angle. So the point is this cosine theta is cosine 90 degrees, which is zero. So that means electric field E is perpendicular to the equipotential surface. So that means basically what we are saying is that if you think about the equipotential surface, to so think about a tangent to the surface here, 
and you thinking about a displacement in that direction, the electric field vector will always make a 90 degree angle. Okay? If you think about say, say you have moved your charge plus Q0 here, the electric field here is pointing radially like this and if your displacement vector ds is this way, so this is the electric field, this is the displacement. If the two th things are at 90 degree, yeah, the electric field is non-zero, the displacement is non-zero, but there's no work done in moving the charge on that surface. Do you see what I'm saying? So the point is that what we learn from here is that the electric field must always be perpendicular to the equipotential surface, right? Okay, now that you know this, let me ask you another question. Here I have what is called a parallel plate capacitor. Remember we have been talking about this for a long time and I told you that there are two chapters in your book which are completely dedicated to capacitors, two whole chapters which will come later on. I think it might be even the next chapter. So basically what, what do we do in these capacitors? We, ha we have one metal plate which we charge with say one kind of charge, say positive charge. The other metal plate we charge with negative charge and we assume that these plates are almost infinitely big. So we'll always assume that the plates are really big so that we can assume that the electric field is constant between the plates. Remember we said that? An electric field points from the positive plate to the negative plate and its magnitude is sigma over epsilon zero. You know, think of these as disks with infinite, infinite dimensions. For a point close to it, it's pretty constant. So we are not going to worry about fringing effects at the edges. Let's ignore that. So if the field is constant, can you think about what would be the equipotential surface for a parallel plate capacitor? Talk to a person next to you. So what would be, think of different equipotential surfaces for a parallel plate capacitor. Can you think of it? And make use of this thing. Electric field must be perpendicular to the equipotential surfaces all the time. Okay, so can you use that to figure out what the equipotential surfaces will look like for a parallel plate capacitor? Talk to a person next to you, please. Anybody, any, anybody has a thought? Go ahead, folks. What, what, what do you think? Any thoughts on this? Anybody? Yeah. Oh, go ahead, please. Uh, wouldn't it just be any uh, flat, like uh, surface and the plane parallel to the? Excellent. I think what he's trying to say is that if you consider any flat surface which is parallel to these two plates, wouldn't that be, so this will be one equipotential surface, this will be another one, this will be another one, anything. In fact, each of these plates themselves are equipotential surfaces. So the point is that since the electric field is pointing from the positive to the negative plate, this is the electric field and if equipotential surface is perpendicular to it, there must be one, I can think of one equipotential surface with some Let us say that the positive plate has a volt of say 10 volts. Let us say that we call the negative plate 0 volts. So that means we have chosen our reference to be such that the negative is 0 and this is 10 volts. There might be another equipotential surface here which has a V of say 8 volts or something. There might be another one over here, there might be another one over here and there another, there is another one over here because I know, do you see what I am saying? Why are those equipotential surfaces? Because think about, for example, bringing a test charge. Suppose I bring a test charge and I move it from here to here, point A to point B. Do you see its displacement is going to be perpendicular to the electric field and so there will not be any work done? So is everybody seeing that each of these plates itself is an equipotential surface and any other thing that you think, any sheet here in between the two plates? that you think which is parallel to the sheets, those are also equipotential surfaces, right? 
is that making sense in fact you know right now you see that there is no voltage it's showing zero but what do you think will happen if i actually charge it by putting this thing over here i don't know if you can see anything i'll i'll show this to you next time why don't we stop here have a great day Professor Singh is a lecturer in the physics department at the University of Pittsburgh. For more information about Professor Singh and her research, visit her website in the description below.